everyone and welcome back! I hope you are ready for a new year full of really exciting projects and all sorts of new experiences because I definitely am ready. Ready for a lot of new things. I have so many plans, so many things that I want to make, so many things that I want to do and accomplish and learn and share with all of you. And as I'm planning these things out, I inevitably think about all of the other projects that I've done over the years and my experiences with them, things that I want to repeat or not repeat with those projects, and things that, quite frankly, were complete and utter failures in many ways. But that's okay. That's actually a good thing, as we're going to get into, to understand the process of making and the goals that are good to have through the process, no matter what you are making. I get asked a lot what my dream project is. What things do I want to make that I just feel like they're just a little outside of my reach. They're just big, unsurmountable things that I am emotionally invested in making. And I always have to quite disappointingly say I don't have any. I used to do dream projects. I used to dream of big, grand things that I just was so emotionally invested in and poured my heart and soul into. And after having done that enough times, I began to realize it wasn't actually the healthiest way to go about things. It didn't get the results I wanted, and I wasn't always happy in the end. In fact, I never was happy in the end. And I learned a lot about myself and about my making process because of that. And I think that it's a good time and a good opportunity as I'm thinking about all the things for the new year to share some of those moments with you. Some of the dream projects that did not come to be, some of the things that were just absolute failures, some of the things that I thought were wonderful and perfect and everything I ever wanted, and then, then things fell apart. And how all of that's okay and I'm better for it. But before I get into all of that, I want to take a moment to thank sponsor for this week's video, Birch Living. With all the physical work that I do, shoemaking, sewing, and filming, I don't have time to wake up sore and tired. I rely on a good night of sleep to reset me for the next day. I mean, we spend a third of our day in bed every day. So my mattress is incredibly important to me, which is why I was so excited to work with Birch Living. Not only do they come with the ease of having a premium mattress delivered to your door, but they understand the importance of materials. I've done entire videos on the history and features of natural textiles and rubber, so the fact that their mattresses are made from organic latex, New Zealand wool, American steel springs, and organic cotton means a lot to me. Birch products even have a variety of certifications showing that they are all non-toxic, organic, and ethically produced. Which means products like organic cotton sheets and their pillows are even made from recycled plastic bottles. And you get two free pillows with every mattress. And the best part is everything is incredibly comfortable. I am a light sleeper and making it through the night used to be a rare occasion. Over the last few months with this mattress, I've been sleeping so soundly and waking up actually feeling rusted which I don't need to tell you how amazing that is. And you don't have to worry about trying it out. With your Birch mattress, you get a 100-night sleep trial, along with 25-year warranty. That means you'll get more than three months to make sure that you love it. And if you don't, they'll pick it up for you, and you'll get a full refund. Birch Living also introduced their new mattress, the Birch Lux. It's made from organic cashmere, organic New Zealand wool, fair trade cotton, and 100% natural latex. All of this is for a mattress that is specifically created with breathability, cooling, and support in mind, and offers increased increased airflow, and targeted zonal lumbar support. The mattress arrives at your door with free shipping in the U.S., and it was so easy to set up, and exciting to unroll and watch it expand. I love my Birch mattress, and I think you would too. If you are looking for a new bed, check out Birch. You can click the link below or go to birchliving.com slash Nicole Rudolph to get $400 off of your mattress, plus two free pillows. Thanks again to this week's sponsor, Birch Living. Now onto the topic of the really scary word of failure. I know, it's an automatic response of it's a terrible, horrible thing. But in reality, as makers, failing tends to get us the best results in the end, because we're not just 
doing something and succeeding every step along the way, following the instructions, everything's working out, and we end up with, yeah, a final finished product. Great, wonderful. But we didn't really learn anything along the way. And I don't mean in the sense of I've made a thing, now I understand how to make it, learning, but actually problem solving to the point where you understand why did they have you do it that way? Or why do you need to do it that way? Why was it historically done that way? Understanding it on a level just beyond do this and then this. So that way you can take that knowledge and apply it to other places. So you understand why the hook and eye is placed that direction or stitched down that way. You understand why the hem has that braid on the bottom. You understand why it's pleated or gathered in this place or that place. So that way when you go to make something else and you don't necessarily have those exact instructions, you understand how it needs to be done. Because understanding this problem solving teaches you far, far more than just following the instructions. And that's just one tiny facet of the idea of failure being a good thing. You're learning, you're growing, not just in your project and in the skills you have as a maker with that topic, but in understanding that sometimes things don't work and you just go back and fix them. Or understanding that maybe taking a little bit more time now will save you time in the future and being okay with that. Not feeling frustrated because you've been told that and you, you know that that's the case, but actually understanding it on a level where you're okay with that because the alternative is far, far worse. <laughs> and realizing that those aspects, that skill that you learn of being able to fail and fix it and it be okay, can apply to every single part of our lives. That is a very difficult skill to learn because it requires you to get rid of your own emotional response of negativity when something doesn't go right. We take it as the end of something. It is a finite, finished moment of dread and ending, and it is really scary. And so instead, I want to talk about how my failures that I've had over the years in some spectacular fashions have actually helped me learn a lot and how I'm able to take all of that stuff that I've learned and push it forward into this year's future projects and future plans. Up first, we have a project that I have talked about the failure of before. My very first pair of shoes. This was definitely something that I poured a lot of emotion into, and I knew that they weren't going to come out perfect at the end, although, to be honest, I am usually such a perfectionist and so nitpicky and take so much time on things to get it exactly right that I really thought I could. And <laughs> I look at them now and they're nowhere near the same quality that I can do now. But the bigger failure wasn't that they weren't the best quality I could have managed. I would have gotten over that, even though I was emotionally invested in trying to do that and realizing now that that was not a healthy way to approach literally doing something for the very first time when it is a massive project like that. But the failure came in the fact that they didn't fit me at all. The measuring was done incorrectly at the beginning and it never got fixed. And unlike clothing where you can try something on multiple times to keep checking on it, shoes, you can make a mock-up, we didn't, and it helped teach my teacher at the time that, yes, some sort of test version, some sort of mock-up is definitely necessary in the process, even if it takes a couple of extra days, it really needs to be done. I took it well. I was okay with the fact that they didn't fit because I learned that I enjoyed shoemaking and I learned how to do things better the next time <laughs> and it became easier every step along the way. So every single pair of shoes that I've made, the next one was a little bit easier. I learned a little bit more that carried me through the rest of shoemaking. Most importantly, I learned that I enjoyed shoemaking enough that even though I didn't get a final pair of very wearable, perfectly wonderful, everything I ever hoped for shoes, I still enjoyed the whole process. And I should probably keep doing that because that was really fun and there's more that I wanna learn. So I keep those shoes as a reminder of how much I've learned, how far I've come, but also a reminder that I'm here not just for the finished product, but for the process, to enjoy the process of learning and discovering. That's why I do these things. That's why I do almost all of the projects that I do. I want to learn and experience more. The next pair of shoes I have to show 
is probably even more of a failure <laughs> in some ways. I haven't shown these to anybody before. This is a pair of riding habit boots from the 1780s. The original is at the Royal Ontario Museum. I was fortunate enough many, many years ago to get to go visit them. I went to make these up on the last that I normally use. Came up with a pattern pretty similar to the originals. Made clearly a couple of adjustments on the proportions of the shoe to make it more aesthetically pleasing to myself and more like another pair of riding habit boots that was in a different museum. Um, and that was a mistake. <laughs> because I ended up with the ultimate boot making mistake. And that's where you can't get your last out or your foot in. <laughs> There's a choke point that occurs right around the bottom point of the ankle where your foot needs to be able to come down and turn to get into the shoe. It's complicated to take those measurements. And the extra irony of the fact that I managed to do this in a pair of boots that is laced up the front, so I thought I was safe, is laced up the front, it'll be fine now. I put that seam up too far and therefore couldn't actually get my foot all the way down into the shoe or get the last out and so therefore had to rip open all of the stitching that I had done and pop the last out that way. The added irony of this is that the person that taught me how to make shoes originally, Brett Walker, he also has a boot hanging on his wall at all times which has the exact same experience, the exact same lesson. Remember not only to make sure to double check that measurement but to just generally double check a lot of things as you go along, that it'll be okay. The last was worth more to me than a shoe that wouldn't be able to fit anyone. So you bust open the shoe and you pull out the last. I haven't had the opportunity or reason to go back and try and make them again. I did also learn at the time that the leather I was using was not the best suited for what I was doing. It was wrinkling and just learned a lot from that. And as the state that it is right now, I kind of use the parts as examples in teaching. And like I said, it taught me a lot about my process and making sure that I really pay attention at the beginning. <laughs> Cause now there's two pairs of shoes that don't fit. Oh well, again, someday I'll get back to that. Someday I'll make those and make them correctly. And I will be able to use all of those things that I learned. Next, I have two of my steampunk ensembles, which taught me two very different things. The first one is meant to be a dance hall costume. It's meant to be turn of the century, right around 1900. You see all of those postcards and images of women in dancing costumes for theatrical purposes. And I spent enough time doing research at the time to recognize that from what I can figure, and I really want to go in and dive deeper into this someday, these seem to actually be secondhand evening gowns that were remade. The bodices were altered slightly, the skirts were definitely altered to be shorter, but you can start to see the not just similarity to evening bodices, but very much they took secondhand evening gowns and remade them, which makes perfect sense. And it also helps us understand how so few of these really grand things survive because they got used for other things like that. And so I made my version just like I would make an evening gown. This included all of the boning structure on the interior. The problem is that the center front of a lot of these is very, very low, which means that I can't wear a typical corset underneath it. So I don't have the bust support there. Bodice has plenty of structure built into it. It's pretty heavy satin. I've built it up with boning and all sorts of structure on the inside. I should be fine to wear it without a corset. Problem was that I built it with the boning inside like I normally would for an evening bodice, which means at the very top inch of the bones is not actually attached to the bodice. This is done as a issue of wear and tear. So down at the bottom where the bones are attached and they sort of flare out, they can sometimes rub on the fabric that they're up against, but you have usually other layers there. There's extra reinforcement you can put in, but up at the top, up at the bust area where it curves out and then back up and in, those bones sticking up too far or pushing up against the fabric can wear that and you can't put a lot of reinforcement in that area. What you can do is pull the bone away from the edge and that casing can be doubled over on top of the bones to help prevent that from working through. And if it does work through, it's more likely to work through the actual casing rather than necessarily rub and work through into the fabric. So it is a prevention of wear, so far as I can tell. If anyone else has other personal experiences and probably failures, therefore, of something going wrong because they didn't do that, I would love to hear about it because it's likely that there are other reasons that they did this. That's just what I've personally found from doing that and from looking at antique bodices. But regardless, I did that on the inside because 
I thought to myself, ah, oh, yes, this must be why they did that. I should also do that. Failing to realize the fact that if I don't have a corset to support and hold the bust in vertically, it's not just a matter of the bust not sitting in the right place. It's a matter of the fact that that fabric will move with you and wrinkle. And if the bones are not attached, they will just kind of jab into your bust a little bit and then the entire bodice will wrinkle in front. So after just a few hours of wearing this very structured and hearty double-sided silk satin bodice with inner lining and boning all this stuff, I had a massive wrinkle across the bottom of my bust. And <laughs> I didn't realize this until I got pictures taken and was like, oh no, that's awful, oh. That looks so bad, oh no. I went back upstairs, took everything off, stitched the boning channels to the bodice the rest of the way so it stayed upright and the wrinkles started to fade. I learned that you really do need understructure, even for that style of bodice, um, and that to skip that, it just doesn't work. <laughs> that I needed to make a specialty corset for it or change the infrastructure of the actual bodice to work that just not doing something was gonna backfire. And it did. So I learned from that. The other steampunk ensemble that uh, was a failure in many ways wasn't discovered as a failure until pretty late in the game. I completed it, it looked lovely, and it's been worn for a few different things, but I used antique and vintage trimming to trim it out. While the rayon trim that I used, the rayon soutache, is great, it survived very well, it's vintage, new old stock, meaning it's never been used, the trim that I put around the edges, which is silk trim, I think is a little bit older and apparently was much more fragile. Though as I was using it and working with it, it didn't crack or shred or break, it seemed in good condition. As it continued to be worn and abraded, it just disintegrated and fell apart. And it didn't matter how pretty that trim was, it didn't matter how much of a wonderful effect it gave it, it, it's destroyed. And I can't save it. The amount of effort to do that would be basically making new trim. So I learned at that moment that it was more important to find something that was going to last than to have something that was silk versus rayon or polyester. That making sure that I had something that I wasn't going to have to replace after one wear is more important than the historically accurate content of it. The last thing that I want to talk about is probably one of the biggest failures because it was just problem after problem after problem after problem. And this was one of the last things that I really feel like was one of my emotionally invested dream projects. And that is this 1895-96 evening gown and cape. I took my time making it. I put a lot of effort and a lot of money into it because it's silk satin. And I went through and made my own pleating board for the organza on the cape, which I learned never to do that again, just to send that off and have it done because it is worth the money. It's not that much, it's worth it. And I put all this effort into it, all of this time into it, and I put it on, it was beautiful. The only problem I noticed off the bat was that the last fitting I had done was before I had put all of the boning in and some of the structure and the finishing and like the facings and that because of that it kind of shrunk a little bit. It usually shrinks anywhere from half an inch to an inch when you put all that structure inside of it and I thought I had laced my corset loose enough when I fit it but I clearly had not so I had to tight lace just a little bit and my body doesn't tight lace. It just it does not compact like that so it was not comfortable but that was the only way we were gonna get this fastened. So I got it on, it was for costume college, went downstairs, did the walk, did the pictures and like, oh, look at this beautiful thing. And we all went out to dinner. I could barely eat anything and was very uncomfortable, especially sitting down for that whole time. We went back to the hotel and I stood downstairs in the lobby talking with people and quickly realized I cannot do this. I cannot. This is so uncomfortable. Went upstairs, tried to get myself out of this thing. It's a back closure with all those hooks. And I learned at that moment, I always have a buddy <laughs> because the very last hook at the center of my back, the hardest one to reach because of the stress of it being just a little bit too tight had popped out and was no longer really being held in place by those extra threads. And so it just, there was no way I was going to be able to manipulate my hands with enough strength at that angle to get that undone. I heard a door open and close in the hallway and I hoped in all the ways that I could that it would be a person that was not just a normal person walking down the hallway. who was going to be really confused, pop my head out 
it was somebody else who was a costumer. Thank goodness. She came over, undid my hook. I thanked her profusely. That was a saving moment. So always have a buddy, always have a friend when you've got back closing things or plan for that event with a front closure. You can always find ways of hiding it and altering things. I got myself out of it and realized that it was completely destroyed. That because I had gotten out of a car and stepped out into a parking garage and failed to fluff my hem correctly and lay it out right or just grab it and carry it with me, that it had folded over itself slightly and had just abraded along the parking garage, picked up oil and dirt and grease, and it was just smeared across the bottom of this ivory satin and yellow silk hem. Ooh first terrifying moment. Then I realized, as I had begun to realize throughout the entire night, that the green cape that I had made, where I had dyed the feathers to match the fabric, I had not properly taken the time to really make sure that that color was well ensconced and was not going to rub off, that it was properly colored fast. And I realized some of it was coming off of my hands because I was handling it. I didn't think much of it till I took everything off and realized that my hands, my neck, my parts of my face, the entire gown, any place that not only the feathers touched, but my hands touched. So my pocket, the fastenings, the waistband, anywhere in front that my hands touched, green. That was a horrifying moment. At that point, I just threw it in the corner and didn't want to look at it again because, oh, that was way too much for me to handle emotionally at that point where I put so much time and effort into that, so much emotional heart into that thing, and it did that. I didn't know if I could save it. Thankfully, I did some tests of the hotel. It seemed to come off a little bit. And when I got home, I spent a lot of hours very gently with OxyClean and detergent and whatever I could that seemed to take out the stains. And I got it back to a fairly decent condition. It would be wearable in a state where unless you knew what you were looking for, you probably wouldn't notice that. That green cape is in its own separate plastic bag and shall not touch anything until I have the chance to pull those feathers off and replace them with something better. <laughs> but, oh, I learned a lot with that one because everything went wrong at the end. I thought it was great. I thought I was done. I thought I accomplished what I wanted. And then it was just an utter disaster and it didn't ruin my evening, but it took all of the joy out of that. It made it very difficult. And the next year, um, I just gave up and wore a 1920s dress because I'm not wearing a corset. I'm not dealing with that stress. So sometimes just being like, no, I'm going to be comfortable. I'm going to make sure that I'm okay with this because it doesn't matter how beautiful and grand something is. If I'm not comfortable, it's not a good experience. It doesn't matter if it's my dream project and I made it everything I ever wanted it to be. If wearing it becomes a bad experience, it stops being perfect in that moment really fast. So that taught me a lot about how I want to invest my time and make sure that I'm doing things correctly and think about the outcome and the results, but also to make sure that I am going to be able to function with this garment because that's really important. Understanding the point of what you're doing. Why are you doing this? Why are you choosing this project versus that? It may be for an event, yes, but why are you making that particular thing? What do you want to get out of it? Do you want to learn about a process? Do you want to learn how to embroider something? Do you want to learn how to fit a garment of that era? Do you want to learn something about that time period or the construction or the function of a piece, the wearability of a piece? What do you want to get out of it? Not just in the construction, but in the wearing and the actual end product. Because if it's for theater, it might just need to be done fast and done now and no one's gonna be up close to it. If it's done for historically accurate reenactment purposes as a teaching tool like what I do, where I'm not only trying to learn and understand how the wearing of these things is done, how the shape of the body changes, how these things function, but I'm also literally showing people the inside of my garments up close and personal. I have different needs than that person for theater or anyone anywhere. I'm going to say in between because it's not aligned. There's just all sorts of different reasons why you're doing things to a certain degree, a level. It's the same reason as why some people prefer natural textiles and some will prefer synthetics and man-made. There's different reasons. It's not that one is better than the other, it's just that they are better for something. If you're going to be out in the heat and you're going to be teaching historical things and you're going to be dealing with functionality of certain types of pieces, 
natural fibers make sense. If you need something that's got a certain luster and effect to it that was probably done by CGI in the first thing, <laughs> you're trying to copy that, you may not be able to find that natural fibers. Or you may not have the money to throw at something that is natural fibers because it can be so much more expensive. How you construct something, what you use to construct it with will change depending on whether it needs to go in the washing machine or not, depending on whether you're going to wear it every day, depending on whether you're going to show someone the inside. And those are things that very widely from project to project, person to person, and they, they should, it's not better or worse. And that's the process of what we learn as we go through and make mistakes, have moments of failure. We learn why one thing works better for us than the other, how we can adapt our future projects to better work with our new knowledge, how we can grow as a person to accomplish bigger things than just a sewing project even, in our everyday lives. How can we take the idea that failure just helps us grow and emotionally deal with that in the rest of our lives? So these things are so much more than just projects. As makers, we are making as a form of experience and growth and adventure in so many ways. And that's one of the reasons why I love planning. I love figuring out all the things I want to do, all the things I have hopes to do, and it's not because they're my dream projects. It's because I'm looking forward to the new experiences. I'm looking forward to failing <laughs> and learning something and growing. I really truly am. I look forward to making mistakes and sharing that. I know I don't necessarily show all of my mistakes all the time, because obviously some of them happen afterwards, and I learn from that later, but I really do try to show the failures that I have along the way and the things I do to fix those. It's just that I've got like 20 plus years of failures <laughs> in this range underneath my belt, so I don't have quite as many as I used to just because I've done that in the past. That already happened. I already failed and fixed it and learned and moved on once before, or 10 times before, because sometimes it is really hard to get that through your head that you need to baste everything, you need to leave extra space, you need to account for shrinkage and just all of that stuff. With that, let's get to the more exciting parts. Because I know that was a big topic, a very scary topic. So let's fill in with some fun things. What do I have planned for the year? Well, first off, the big event that I've got for this year isn't until October. And that's a vintage style cruise that I'm going to be going on with Abby and some other friends. And it's going to be headlined by Dandy Wellington, who is such an amazing person and musician. And I am so excited to get to go on a week long transatlantic cruise with just a bunch of people that are as crazy as I am. I do need to basically create an entirely new wardrobe for this fortunately and unfortunately. So I'm going to be creating a very well planned and chosen capsule wardrobe of vintage attire, because though I used to dress entirely in vintage, as of just even three years ago, I had almost nothing but 1930s clothes. But my body has changed, my tastes have changed, and I am not comfortable in a lot of those things that I used to wear regularly. It doesn't feel like me. I'm not happy with them anymore. They're still wonderful dresses. They're just I, it's just not me. So all of those things have added up to just finding it better to almost start over. There will be some things I pull and use, but I'm pretty much starting from scratch with this. I'm really interested in the 1919 to 1922 period. A lot of it's going to focus on that and making some wonderful suits. It's got to work really well as a variety of different purposes. So I'm going to have evening events and tea times, and we're going to probably be traveling for a week out of time. So I've got to figure out two weeks worth of outfits that can be walking around London or be functioning as evening things for the cruise or dancing. There will definitely be dancing. So I need these things to function in many different ways and I need to be practical about it. So I'm going to be very meticulously planning that out. I do have most of the fabrics that I need for that, and I will be starting on that right away. I won't be doing that the whole time. I'm going to try and kind of separate it out, spread it out into lots of different projects. One of the other things I really want to do this year, not surprisingly, is more shoemaking, though I will probably make some shoes specific for that trip. I'm also really interested in the 1890s right now in terms of shoe styles. So I will probably be making a last and shoes from that era. I'm also very interested and have been for a very, very long time 
honestly maybe slightly obsessed with 1851 shoes. There was a great exhibition that year and there were a lot of shoes that were entered into it and they're just beautiful and some of them look just non-functional but they're just gorgeous and I I want to understand them better. On top of that, 1851 and the Great Exhibition was a major year. Um, the Great Exhibition is full of amazing and wonderful things and horrible and terrible things. So it is a complex thing, but I feel like that is the sort of stuff that I really love to share with you guys and you really enjoy. So definitely looking forward to that. And who knows what other eras and styles of shoes as I end up with new originals that I want to copy or things I need them for. So definitely more shoemaking. I want to show you some of the last making process. I hesitate to say teach you how to make a last because I'm still learning, but I'm going to show you one of the ways that I go about that. And I also definitely want to do at least one more historical cosplay. And it's going to be a little bit different in the fact that I'm not going to be taking something that already exists and trying to take a historical-ish garment that's supposed to be kind of from an era and making it correctly. I'm taking a character and I'm taking the aesthetics of that character and I'm placing them into a different time period. It still feasibly works within the character. I'm not giving you the character yet. Um, I'm sure some of you can guess. Just keep it inside. Just keep it in. I'm planning on doing this in a time period I'm not used to. This is the one that scared me back in the fall. I want to do something either very early 17th century or more like 1570s, 1580s, somewhere in that like Tudor era, late 16th century. I haven't decided which. I keep going back and forth on this. I have a lot of supplies already. I just, I can't pin it down. Um, and it's a scary era for me because I don't know a lot. It's not as easy to research as say the 19th and 20th centuries are. I don't have just a slew of written documents to access. So I'm going to be harassing my friend Samantha for that a lot. Um, because if you have not seen her channel, she does a lot of amazing things in that era uh, and knows so much. But again, it's a time period I've always wanted to do. It's a character I've always wanted to do. And I'll probably have to make shoes for that too. Because again, I don't have shoes for that era. Uh, so I'll probably have to make a last for that even. I feel like this is more than I'm going to accomplish in a year. But these are all things that I want to do, whether it's this year or next year. Stuff that has been inspiring me lately. Stuff that has made me curious. I've wanted to learn more about. And I am trying to give myself a little bit more space this year to really focus on projects the right way. So I'm not drawing myself thin and st just stressing myself out trying to get stuff done on a deadline right away. Oh no, I don't have enough time. And just frantically sewing. I want to be able to enjoy these things a little bit more. I want to have that show through and to be able to fill these things out a little bit better as I go to do them. With that in mind, I'm going to be doing two weeks on, one week off for my videos. So that way I have a little bit of break time in between sets is going to be filled by other things as well. Things that aren't quite as um, intensive as far as work hours for me. So I've already started streaming on Twitch a lot more. I'm going to try to make that a once to twice a week thing, maybe once a week scheduled and once a week spontaneously. It's just going to be me sitting and doing whatever I'm working on currently. We'll just sit and chat. It's very casual, very much just hangout sort of situation. If you want more formalized lives and you want more interaction and you want more technical information and more instructional information, I highly recommend heading on over to my Patreon. I have four different levels there and I'm not changing them necessarily for the year, but I'm trying to flesh them out and get more content in there with that in mind. So the first level is just the really basic early access to videos without advertisements on them and behind the scenes stuff. Next up, we have a level where it includes a once a month live, which is much more formalized. One of the last ones I did was, I got these three new antique bodices. Let's take a look and discover them together. And lots of questions and answers encouraged there. And there's also a discord through that level. So that way people can come and ask questions. And if you want some extra assistance there, extra interaction, that's a place to go for that. The next level up, the third level, I currently have it set where I'm adding extra video content to that. And I've kind of been all over the place with what sort of video content I want to make. And I've decided I think it might be best. I will probably put still some artistic things in there as I do them. But because I'm not going on a lot of trips and taking beautiful, just gorgeous film and 
being able to do artsy stuff with that, but a lot of it's going to become a bit more instructional. So I just put one out on how to take a pattern off of an antique garment. The next one will be how to then digitize that pattern. There will be more and more informational stuff there, and when I can throw some artistic stuff in, I will. So there will be a lot more content there if you want more instructional things. And I am very, very glad to take requests. And then the top tier adds in some personalized art stuff. I am going to be trying to add a lot more to that tier just because I want to do a lot more art this year. I really miss that, both digital and physical in my hand art. I love doing that stuff, I miss doing it, and I think that is really just across the board useful, not just for that tier, but also so that way I can turn it into things like merch because I love doing art. I might as well put it on things and make it available to people, right? So some of those things will end up being accessible to Patreons and some of those things will go into merch that you can purchase if you are not on my Patreon and just a whole bunch of different things that I want to try this year. I want to do more than just make another video and make another video. I want to try lots of different things, put them in lots of different places and find where I can share this information the best way, where I can share my experiences and my knowledge in the best format possible because not everything is best as a YouTube video. That's what I learned this year. So this is good all around for everybody. So I invite you to take a look at Twitch. If you haven't really been on there before, I promise it's not too confusing. I am learning too. I am having a great time with it. I recommend going and looking at the Patreon, seeing if something in there works for you. I'm going to be trying to get a lot more stuff out this year. I'm so excited about all of the things in the future for this year and beyond. And I hope you guys are too. I can't have you on this side. It makes life no, I know, I know, but it makes editing so hard because <laughs> you don't sit still. Oh my god, come here. Come on. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Halfway there. Make it the rest. Oh my goodness. Yay. Other pillow. Just as good. Okay.